Thank you so much for having us here. With us today are Marissa Baradaran, professor of law at UC Irvine and author of Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. Also with us today is Derek Hamilton, founding director of the Institute for Study of Race and Political Economy at the New School. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. So today we'll discuss your perspectives on the systemic and historical underpinnings of the racial wealth gap that still persists today. Some of the ways that the racial wealth gap perpetuates a barrier to sustainable economic mobility and solutions that can be undertaken by direct service organizations and the varying levels of government to address it. So my first question to you both is, why are we talking about the racial wealth gap at a conference about poverty? So there's this persistent idea in some circles that the best way to address racial disparities in poverty is to just do a better job of addressing poverty, that a rising tide will lift all boats, and that this is a class issue, not a race issue. I don't just want to ask you why you think this is wrong, because I have so many thoughts on why that's wrong. I want to ask you how we can reach out to people who believe that and show them that they need to center racial equity in their activism. And Marissa, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there is, of course, you know, two different conversations that I, I'm always surprised where, you know, if you talk about race, someone says, well, why isn't this about class? And and and, and it is a frustrating um, uh, pivot, I think, that that happens. But but we have a race based credit and banking system um, beyond just inequality. So even when inequality is low. So, you know, looking at historically between 1934 to 1970, we had low levels of inequality, lower levels of poverty than we have now. But that racial wealth gap was still built on uh, a, a explicit racial exclusions from certain credit, housing, uh, GI Bill benefits. And so insofar as you, we've embedded race into uh, you know, government subsidies and uh, neighborhoods and, you know, these exclusions are have been embedded in the law for hundreds of years. You actually can't talk about just poverty. You can't just raise up the floor and that's going to take care of race. We have to actually address the thing that was the problem, which was that we didn't just give out mortgages to everyone. We gave out mortgages to everyone except for black people. And so you can't just say, OK, well, now we're just going to give it to everyone and have color neutrality, right? Racial, what do you call it? Color blindness and this will take care of the problem. That's not how the problem was created. It wasn't created on a colorblind basis. And so the solution uh, need not be or should not be colorblind because that's not it's going to address the problem. Right. And Derek, what do you think of Maris's analysis of this sort of refusal to, to undo this problem in this colorblind way? Well, Merce is always on point, so you won't <laughs> get a disagreement from me uh, to recognize that we can have some colorblind ideology in a society that is predicated on on race. I mean, all our institutions and, and the historical examples of, by which we have inequality today, as Mercer just described. But I also want to say, when you said rising tide lift all boats, that provokes a visceral reaction from me, because I know where it's grounded from. It comes from that supply side economics, this notion that just through markets and facilitating growth amongst the elite that somehow this is going to trickle down to all of us. And mm -hmm. what is the fuel to um, stimulate that type of narrative is this notion of deserving and undeserving. This notion that when you have government intervention, that somehow you're tilting the scale in favor of people who don't deserve it, or worse, you're creating dependencies amongst them that lead to detrimental behaviors that ultimately becomes the explanation for why they're poor. And that's problematic. I mean, and, and this gets to the answer of your question. Why study wealth? Because an understanding of poverty is an understanding that poverty is ultimately not grounded in decisions or behaviors, but resources itself. So why, you know, uh, uh, even thinking about solutions, I, I think about Martin Luther King when in his Poor People's Campaign, when they advocated for federal job guarantees and, and direct income, direct cash support. That was all predicated in a notion that the most direct way to eliminate poverty is to literally eliminate poverty, literally get rid of it. But yet we've come up with these notions of deserving and undeserving that have tilted us away from it. And then I'm, I'm going to say a couple of other things and I'll stop. One is we need to stop thinking about managing poverty 
and actually think about ending poverty and empowering people. And what better way than to think about assets? If you want authentic agency in your life, it comes from resources. It comes from wealth. Wealth is a different concept than income. Income is a flow, a periodic reward, typically in exchange for labor, and it's often used for subsistence needs. But if we want to empower people to have authentic agency, you need some economic security. You need some breathing room. You need some ability to withstand a shock from something like a pandemic, where if you are, for example, an essential worker and you didn't have any wealth and you had a pre-existing condition, you really don't have a choice but to go out and put your life on the line so that you can you can survive. Now we need to reframe poverty and get out of that framework. The, the right. ultimate pre-existing condition is wealth itself. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, I always remind my students when they, you know, sort of fall into the bootstrap, bootstraps tropes, um, there are institutional mechanisms that make sure some people actually never have boots. So how can we have a bootstrap conversation if some people have never had boots before? Now, Marissa, I want to go uh, go back to you and sort of in keeping with the theme of this conference, can you both talk about how the pandemic, as, as Derek just mentioned, and the economic crisis has affected the racial wealth gap and how it is underlined its significance? Um, you know, I think in every way possible, this pandemic has highlighted problems that have been existing, pre-existing. And, 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 and one of the things that everyone seemingly understood about the pandemic was that it was nobody's fault. It wasn't something that, you know, people brought upon themselves, although you did hear that at first, you know, all these are, you know, conditions, you know, like, oh, unhealthy people or whatever. But, but that kind of quickly got shut down rightfully. Um, so, so you have this external event that is happening. And what happens when an external shock comes to the system, well, look, look who's getting hurt the most. Look who's dying at an in increased rate. Look who's not getting the subsidies, right? Not getting the PPP funds, not getting the stimulus checks on time, right? What, what, um, uh, 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 communities are there um, shocks of housing, um, police brutality that are coming up, and it's the same communities that are always vulnerable. Just you see that the acuteness of it when you have this external shock, and I, I do think that it does take sometimes um, an event like that to see um, the desperation uh, that is always existing. So I, I use desperation just because I'm thinking about the Great Depression and reading about that being this system wide shock, and of course, black communities suffered more profoundly than other communities because of the legacies of Jim Crow segregation and and it just, you know, explicit racial violence. Um, and yet it was seen as this was no one's fault except for maybe bankers. Right. But we have a, a system wide response like the New Deal that is not about stigmatizing people's poverty. It's like here's this external shock and here's a government response because we are all, you know, a society that needs to, to, to respond to um, to these shocks. And um, in, in the COVID uh, sort of response, you did see a little bit of that New Deal thinking, but a lot of the, you know, quote unquote, neoliberal rising tide lifts all boat kind of, you know, supply side economics where you have this, this um, you know, uh, these two things coming together, the stigmatization and the personalization of, of, of poverty and, 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 and loss, and also this recognition that this is not a, a personal decision. Nobody chose for this to happen. And so I, so I do think that this is a really good time and, and it, it is, has welcomed some of that uh, re-evaluation. So in a way there is um, at least a conversation about the dignity of work as, as, as Derek has so profoundly been, you know, right on this for many years, but people are, are starting to talk about well, what is essential work? What does it mean that the people on whom we literally are surviving on the, the, the delivery workers, the, the essential frontline workers are actually the most vulnerable, not mm -hmm. just to the pandemic, but to uh, wage theft and and shocks mm -hmm. like that. And so what does that mean, you know, to say, well, what is work that's necessary? And for us, someone like me who can not work for a year, not go into an office and the world right. will be fine without me, you know, really hopefully uh, gives people a sense of what is actually work and what is, you know, other other right. things. 
Well, I mean, Marissa, you know, and Derek, I want to bring you in here because what Marissa mentions, I'm all, I'm also thinking um, a century later after the New Deal, we know that black women were largely excluded from so many of the New Deal policies and practices economically. I'm thinking about black female mm -hmm. domestic workers. So even in this pandemic, we're seeing with the allocation of PPE that you mentioned, Marissa, you know, Tom Brady's got it, but so many small black business owners don't. And quite honestly, they're still reeling from 2008 and the crisis there. And so they may never come back economically. So Derek, can you talk to us a little bit more and build on what Marissa said about this conflation of uh, a global pandemic that's hit the United States particularly hard and also the economic crisis? Yeah, no, I think fundamental to all of this is that we make the mistake of looking at race as an issue, looking at policy as an issue, and then looking at economics as an issue, but we don't tie them all together. That race, policy, and economics are intricately related and not separable. You cited the example of domestic workers being excluded from the New Deal, um, the original legislation. That was not a coincidence. That was by design. That was a feature. You, we, we can go on and talk about ways in which the economy itself, we need government interventions uh, in a multiple framework for, for the economy uh, to, to move on. I, I actually lost you all on the screen. That's why I got a little, distract, little distracted. But to sum up my main point to get to the answer, all of this is tied together. Our reaction to the pandemic, perhaps if we didn't have um, the face of it so black, uh, for, and what do I mean by that? If, if we didn't have, um, I, I actually just lost my train of thought because I got distracted by the, the video change. Uh, so um, I'm going to pause for a second to see if I can come back. Okay, so, but this next question, I think will help build on some of the things that you and Marissa have, have already started to discuss. So Marissa, I'll, I'll get with you and hopefully we can mm -hmm. get Derek back. But one of the common tropes in discussing this racial wealth gap is this idea that it's up to black people to overcome it through this idea of financial literacy or greater educational achievement or leadership from black entrepreneurs. And this trope is often echoed even by well-meaning leaders even by well-meaning Black leaders. So how can we change the conversation to make it clear that addressing the wealth gap isn't the sole responsibility of the Black community? And you know what, Derek, are you back with us? I, I am back. And, and I okay, got my so game face on. I'm going to adjust to the technology <laughs> and keep it moving. That's right. So um, how do we address this, this trope that's often used um, when addressing the wealth gap and, and, and sort of making it the sole responsibility of the Black community? You know, the reality is that wealth becomes the best indicator to diffuse that trope. Now, if we look empirically, even when black people are able to acquire the so-called credentials and the uh, protective factors for economic security, like education, the wealth gap remains vast. Not only that, it gets to the point where it rises with higher levels of education. So when you look at head of households that are black, that have a college degree, they typically have less wealth than white families where the head dropped out of high school. And this doesn't just extend to education, even in the realm of employment. Typically, black households where the head is full-time employed, they have less wealth than families where the head is unemployed. So wealth is an outcome that is more functional in terms of generating one's economic positioning than determined by things that we invest in. In other words, we think about the functional role of education in leading to economic mobility to the extent where we don't think about the roles of power and wealth itself, that power and wealth itself might actually be more determinant of one's education than vice versa. Basically, we got the causality wrong. If, and if we want to... Go ahead. Oh, keep going. I mean, and, and also this comes back to the solutions. If we if we want to address racial inequality, education is important in its own right. We need to have a society where people are, are trained with uh, sympathetic teachers in a curricula that's relevant to them so that they can, one, have the privilege and benefit of being able to synthesize information into big ideas. Frankly, we need more of that to change society, to get rid of this status quo of growing inequality. But if we're thinking about individual well-being, um, we ignore the roles of power, structure, and wealth itself. 
and its ability to generate economic outcomes. And, and what better indicator to make that case than wealth itself? You know, I'll give you one more statistic that shows that independent of class, race prevails and we need to have a power lens. For black families that do not have a college degree or black families in general, we know that there's an alarming mortality rate where black families are 50% more likely to die between the ages of 25 and 64 compared to their white counterparts. But what's more disheartening, black families or black individuals with a college degree have about a 70% higher mortality rate than white individuals with a college degree. And I dare say that narrative of keep working hard, keep pushing through, work twice as hard to get by, overcome right. your barriers and stop making excuses. I dare say that that's probably that narrative in and of itself contributing to bad health amongst black people. We never ask at what cost when we work twice as hard to get by. Wow. I mean, I think that's so powerful as we think about this idea of canceling student debt. And we've seen that black people or black women especially are disproportionately affected by trying to get into that upper echelon and, and taking out loans to, to attend colleges and universities. Marissa, I want to bring you in because I'm still really thinking about, you know, what you said about FDR and the New Deal and black women being excluded specifically and explicitly uh, from so many policies, but also the GI Bill. So many men coming back from the war, not able to go to college and start that generational wealth, not able to build a home or buy a home in particular neighborhoods or at all so that they can't pass on uh, that wealth to their their offspring when they pass on. And obviously, you know, the brutal violence that we saw with soldiers returning from the war, not just not getting the benefits, but being lynched in their uniforms because they were leaders of the community. So how do we put all of that together in thinking about uh, erasing some of these tropes about sort of black respectability and black excellence and in, in trying to black mobility uh, as as the responsibility of the black community? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's two questions here uh, and I, I'm struggling with which to answer but because they're both really important. One is, I mean, the data could not be more clear that this is not a personal responsibility issue. This is not a hard work issue. You can look any which way. You can look at the bottom, you can look at the top. I mean, look at the top 1% and tell me that that wealth is a reflection of hard work and not just intergenerational wealth and privilege. And, and the fact that like, you know, you have these scions of fortunes who who are working i mean this is you know we 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 have you can look up there you can look at the bottom you can look at the fha loans and the explicit exclusions of black homeowners with dual uh, you know duly employed uh you know professionals in the, the the nicest neighborhoods and nicest sort of black neighborhoods in the country that were redlined not given fha mortgages you've got the gi bill as you mentioned you have black domestic work completely being excluded excluded because they were black, not accidentally, not incidentally, purposefully. So there's the data. But I also think that there is just no way to convince someone who doesn't want to believe that. And I, I do think that, you know, we we're seeing this with a lot of stuff, you know, vaccines or, you know, how do you get someone to believe something if they don't want to? So the question is like, why, why won't people understand this? Why, why can't they understand this? And, and how do you get them to understand something that they, they can keep coming up with arguments about, oh, it's, you know, you know, you, you've all heard this, oh, it's, maybe it's the fathers and maybe they, if they should stop spending and there's just like a million things in the grab bag. And it's like this shifting argument that then you have to step back and be like, there is nothing that I can throw at you. There's no statistic or data. And this is not something that as a professor, as an economist, Derek over there is comfortable with, but there's not enough data and history and evidence that, 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 that will convince certain folks that, that this is the issue because there is this intr intransigence and this feeling of uh, undeservingness of, of quite frankly, racism uh, that, I, I, if I knew how to fix, I, I would have done the magic potion, but perhaps, you know, um, I, I do think that policy can come first and ideas will have to lag. I think there are many examples of this in our history where Italians were also discriminated against, not to the extent that, uh, you know, black Americans were, but were discriminated against. And once they got included into that FHA 
you know, mortgage program and the GI Bill, and they moved to Levittown and weren't subject to that racial covenant, that stigma over time goes away. And so now Americans are, our Italians are quote unquote normal Americans. So how does that happen? Well, it's not that we changed hearts and minds. It's that you let them move into Levittown with that FHA mortgage and that GI Bill and go to school and you just kind of it goes away. And and I'm not naive. I do think that the American racial structure is cemented into an anti-black sort of uh, uh, lens. So, um, but but I think policies can can help uh, before waiting for hearts and minds to change. And I, I, so that's my hope. Right. So let's let's move to solutions because a lot of you know I'm sure the the members of the audience today want to know, knowing all of this information, knowing the historical inequities that have real world consequences in policy even today, how do we begin to unravel it, right? Obviously having a black president for eight years didn't do it. Having black mayors in cities didn't do it. Something is baked into the soil of this idea of not just white supremacy and anti-black racism, but there's this racialized capitalism that seems to be embedded into the ethos and the foundation of American democracy. So if we're thinking about solutions, it is, as many people have observed, expensive to be poor. I'm thinking about uh, Derek, you know, we're both in New York City. Uh, we can buy monthly Metro cards when we were out and about in society. Obviously people who are poor have to sort of buy uh, a single ride, which, uh, you know, costs them uh, triple what we would pay in a single month, just as a small example. So it's expensive to be poor, but some ideas to address this that you've each championed are postal banking, which Marisa, you've written about, and Baby Bonds, which Derek, you've architected. Um, can you tell us about each of these and how they address systemic barriers to creating and maintaining wealth for Black families? So Marisa, I'll start with you. Can you tell us a bit more about Baby mm -hmm. Bonds? I mean, excuse uh, me. Well, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I will say that uh, I actually think that uh, postal banking is is a particular solution to a particular problem, which is the unbanked and underbanked, which is not exactly, I, I don't think postal banking gets us close to closing the racial wealth gap. It removes one of the stings of having lost access to a bank account. I think, you know, my, you know, to the extent I have solutions for, for the racial wealth gap, it's to point to folks like Derek and, and others who have talked about a more robust program um, of measurement and repair. Uh, you can call it reparations, we can call it, you know, and, and do it in a variety of ways, whether it's baby bonds, housing, um, mortgage, grant, you know, uh, looking at the ways that wealth was created. Historically, you've got land transfers, you have capital transfers, you have, uh, you know, uh, credit structures that are not subprime, not high cost credit, but wealth building credit. So any and all of those things, I think because the w racial wealth gap was created across a variety of institutions at the federal, state and local levels, it, it will require a robust response that is not just a one off. I mean, this wasn't created over five years. It cr was created over hundreds of Re, redoing, you know, and, and, and innovating new ways to uh, create the racial wealth gap. And I don't think it will take 100 years to fix, but it, it's not going to be like a one and done. And I think it takes a lot of different experts to come together and, and want to fix it. And I think we, we could, we can fix it. It's just not an overnight. Right. Well, I mean, Derek, you know, as my grandmother used to always say, if we can put a man on the moon, we can figure this out. So why is it that we can't seem to figure this out, right? So yeah. why can't we figure out baby bonds? Why can't we do uh, postal banking? Why can't we sort of figure out ways to support the unbanked? I mean, it's the 21st century. We've got technology by and large. We've got lots of, you know, hearts and minds on this. We have historic evidence that what has been done, certain things have not worked. Other things on small scales have. So how do we move forward with this? And what are some of your ideas to solutions for this problem? So Christina, you and your grandmother are spot on. And, and I'm going to be so arrogant to say that the solutions are easy and simple. I, we, yeah. I, you know, the problem with wealth is capital itself. The, the problem with being vulnerable to having to pay more for cashing your check or storing your, your resources is you don't have an account. Martin Luther King... Coretta Scott King, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they had a rights frame. They understood that there are certain goods and services that without them, you really don't have authentic agency in your life. We talk a lot about political and civil rights, 
But human rights are not complete without economic rights. So it's, it's a society committing to justice, a moral society recognizing that if there's poverty, literally eliminate it. If, if, if there's a problem, we know how you generate wealth. It is wealth that begets more wealth. If you're wealthy and you do nothing but put your money in an account, it will generally rise and accumulate in a way faster than most people. So empower people with some capital at birth. That's the idea around baby bonds. It's not genius. And in fact, um, Thomas Paine talked about it as far back as 1787, I think. Uh, so the idea is you allow people to have some resources when they're a young adult so that they're not starting out. You know, we, we do it with Social Security. So baby bonds can be thought of as thinking about Social Security over the life course. When you're a young adult, just entering adulthood, I lost my screen again, but I'm going to be all right this time. Uh, you need to have some capital to put you in an asset like a home, like a debt-free education, like the ability to start a business. The difference between an entrepreneur and a worker, um, and I'm going to make it simple, is often capital. The difference between a homeowner and a renter is often capital. So baby bonds gives everybody access to an asset that will passively appreciate over your lifetime. Last thing I'll say, or a couple more things is, we need to think about this in terms of a package of economic rights. In addition to baby bonds, you need postal banking. You need to have access to an account, uh, irrespective of your race, gender, or economic positions in the 21st century. Uh, this, you, Christina, you raised this earlier. You should have access to a debt-free college education, aside from all those functional arguments about what a college degree can do in the workplace, because it's the right thing to do. In the 21st century, if we can't afford our young people with the privilege of going to a college, we're not, we're, we're a morally inept society. We can do better, we can afford to do better. Now, what's not easy and what's not simple is the politics of implementing these solutions. So we, we know the policies, but the politics is such that we have these narratives of deserving and undeserving that's very racialized. And the, and, and the way to get beyond this is to redefine economic well-being to justice, to think about hum, human capacities, to think about morality and sustainability. These are not pie in the sky, but how we would define our economy, that, that how we define the economy is predicated on our value system. And if we want to convince people, then we need to start acting. The more unequal we are, the more susceptible people are to narratives like Donald Trump, who's able to come in and say, at least I'll, you won't be like those Mexicans I'm going to build a wall to protect you from. So my, my main point is that, and here I'm going to be perhaps partisan, Democrats left us vulnerable to somebody like Donald Trump, because when we had power or when they had power, they didn't act enough to create policies to, to um, mitigate some of the, the vulnerabilities to white supremacy. Right. Well, as a political scientist, I, I'm, I'm holding it all in right now. <laughs> you know, I have lots to say about the last four years. But I do want to follow up, though, on, you know, trying to really push you all a bit more on the solutions. Because, Marissa, you know, when you said reparations, it was almost like a whisper. Right. Because we know some people have a visceral reaction to even the word reparations. But mm -hmm. for so many of these inequities, is that one of the only ways that we're actually going to lift certain boats that have been deliberately left out in the cold? And we figured out a way to sort of provide social welfare to farmers all across the United States. Mm -hmm. We don't call it social welfare, but they're on welfare and have been for several generations. So how do we put into practice what you and Derek have laid out uh, without either calling it reparations or or sort of specifically targeting black people to help them economically undo some of the unjust practices politically and economically over the past, you know, I'll yeah. say one century, but. <laughs> The thing with reparations is that it is uh, it has a technical meaning that we've used historically to like indicate, you know, like war reparations or specific harm. And what's happened in the United States, you know, 
to African Americans is not one specific harm. It is a, a, a history of hundreds of years and a variety of different things, right? So there's, you know, enslavement, and then, you know, uh, the FHA exclusions, and then the GI Bill, and then criminal, you know, the, the, the law and order kind of stuff. There's the death penalty. I mean, there's so many different harms related to a, a, a racial system that reparations almost seems like a too small of a word, and maybe that's the whisper. I mean, you know, I teach contracts. I've taught contracts for a decade, and there are, like, you know, treatises written on damages. What kinds of damages are adequate for a specific harm? So there's, do you bring the person up to where they would have been had the contract been fulfilled? Do you do unjust enrichment? Do you cough up your unjust gains? Do you, you know, uh, compensate someone up to where they thought they would be? You know, there's, there are, you know, just that, like volumes of legal tomes written to this idea of damages. And so I don't, I don't want to, you know, I think that, that this also deserves that type of thinking to say these damages are well accounted. Now, which theory of damages or all of them are we going to use to make things right? And under no circumstances are we going to make things right? Under no circumstances is it possible to repair the damages that have been wrought? How do, but you know, and, and courts sometimes recognize that, right? When you have a wrongful death, someone has died because someone screwed up. And so you can't bring that person back and maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, divulging your unjust gains or whatever can at least get you to that point. And so I, I do think it's a, it's not complicated. I, I think the will has to be there and the, the legal structure is already mm -hmm. there. We just need to be able to put that together and have the, the will and the drive to fix it, which we have not had until this right. point. And that's why I think reparations has become so controversial, where it should not be. Yeah. Right. Well, in the in the last two minutes we have, um, you know, in, in sort of moving beyond this kind of zero sum game that serious that clearly so many Americans feel. Uh, Derek, I'll start with you in the last two minutes. What do you see as the single most actionable response to the wealth gap that we can organize around in 2021? And what's the one big thing you see is doable this year? So what are the action steps we can give the people at this conference to sort of know, take away and act on moving forward in 2021? I mean, if we have to hone in on one, baby bonds is one that has some political viability. Um, but, you know, I do want to make clear baby bonds and reparations are complements, not the same. So I would I would recommend that everybody work on this momentum in, in Congress and momentum at local levels uh, to push for endowing everybody with some capital endowment so that they can uh, have the benefits of asset appreciation over their life. Thank you. And Marissa? What is sort of the single most actionable response to the wealth gap that we can organize around in 2021? What's doable for the participants uh, of this conference? You know, I think uh, a federal um, study measurement, uh, a, a data reporting of what the wealth gap has cost all of us, but specifically certain communities, and just to get our, our heads around that data and to, to call it out from all the different agencies. That's a step one to me is just to have have some acknowledgement that these were uh, these these harms were done. This was the cost and to kind of go forward. So I, I would like to see, you know, a federal government, a federal reserve response, a treasury response, FHA response, a, you know, FDIC response across the Department of Education. Right. Uh, but first, we need to measure the damage. Uh, and have a government acknowledgement of that. And, and I think that that could be something achievable very quickly. Mm. I, I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about this and sort of this idea of a, an American truth and reconciliation of sorts, of all right. the different ways. I mean, yeah. Derek talked mm -hmm. about sort of kind of braiding all of these ideas together. Um, well, you said put them together. I thought about the three of them being braided together because they they are inextricable um, and how we would do that as a, as a society to recognize what has happened and to also acknowledge fully um, how those past practices still play out in policies uh, that we see in the 21st century, specifically and explicitly to this day with Black Americans uh, in this country. I can't thank you both enough for joining us today. Um, I know our audience uh, learned a ton. I know I did. Uh, 
I'm Christina Greer, professor of political science at Fordham University. Uh, you've been listening to Marissa Baradaran, a professor of law at UC Irvine and author of Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, and also Derek Hamilton, founding director of Institute for Study of Race and Political Economy at the New School in New York. Thanks so much, both of you. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure.